Okay, here we go. Welcome. Hope everyone's having a, a good week so far. I uh, have a flock of birds for you today. These ones uh, arrive in eastern Washington in the, the colder months. Uh, the Bohemian waxwing. Uh, and they'll perch way up high in these flocks, and then they'll all in a rush descend down to some place where there's food, like this crabapple tree. Uh, but birds don't want to be eaten by things, and so they think there's some potential danger nearby. They'll take off and, and fly away. And when you have a whole bunch of birds in a flock, all of which are like constantly paranoid that something is going to eat them, what ends up happening is a flock of 50 birds goes down to the tree. They're there for maybe two seconds before one of them freaks out, flies away, and the whole 50 of them go back up, which means they have to uh, eat very fast. Uh, so they'll kind of perch at all sorts of different angles, trying to get at, at the, the crab apples or whatever it is. Uh, and here's the story of, of this one particular waxwing. Uh, it wants to, to eat a crab apple and it, it uh, grabs one. And, you know, it's a bit large for the size of, uh, size of the bird. Uh, it's almost got it, but alas, sad bird. Crab apple gets away, uh, but you know there are plenty of there uh, there in the tree, uh, and in this picture you can see the kind of colorful like yellow tips uh, to the tail and this this reddish color as well. All right, that's birds for today. Uh, what questions do you have about uh, the Enigma machine? Um, uh, any of the any of the things we've been we've been working on, Maya. Sure. The final project proposal due on Friday. And I'm looking for a few things out of this proposal. Doesn't need to be uh, to be that that long. I'm not looking for pages and, and, and pages. Uh, first. Who is working on the project? So if you're working with a partner, the way that you tell me that is that your final project proposal has two people's names on it. A kind of high level description of the project. Uh, if it's a game, what game is it? What are the rules or how does the game work? If it's a simulation, what is it simulating? What are the things in the simulation? So just kind of a description of the project. Then uh, I would like some sort of code outline. So this would be uh, <coughs> functions that you think you will need to implement. Uh, as part of this project, uh, classes that you uh, want to define as part of the project, um, uh, if there's some particular algorithm or, or some procedure uh, that's like this, the central piece of the project, you can outline that here, but uh, I'm not looking for some like complete uh, uh, breakdown of all parts of the code necessarily. Like this is here, so that as part of proposing this project, uh, you will have before you start working on it thought about what are the different pieces. Like what are the different functions? How will they work together? Or what objects will there be? And then finally. A development plan which has kind of two purposes. Mm -hmm. 
The first is for you to describe kind of what is the minimum simplest working version of this project? Because your goal should be to get the simplest minimum working version working. And then once that is done, start making it more complicated, start bringing in uh, other things that were part of your description. So kind of identify what is the thing you're going to get working first, because in terms of how the project is evaluated, something that is working will earn a better grade than something that's more complicated but doesn't run and, and crashes. The other part of the development plan is thinking through the order of work. So say your code outline said, I'm going to need these two classes, which each have these methods. The order of work says, OK, I'm going to, uh, to make this concrete if you were uh, implementing a, um, uh, say, like a, a Yahtzee type game where you're like rolling dice to try and make different combinations. You might say, OK, first I'm going to make my dice class. And it's going to be able to roll and remember a number. And I'll test that to make sure it's working. And then I'll uh, make my kind of game function that's going to create a set of dice. Uh, and then a player class that keeps track of someone's score. Uh, so just kind of what are the, in what order are you going to work on the different pieces and how are you going to make sure that a piece is working before moving on to the next? So uh, kind of parts three and four are um, not for my benefit, uh, but for your benefit. I'm expecting them because I think it will be very valuable to think about both these things before you start working on the project. Questions on any part of the proposal or other things about the final project? Any other questions at all? All right. Today we are going to uh, bring order to the universe. We're going to tame, if only for a moment, the cruel forces of entropy. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can take uh, a list of things and put it in sorted order. So first off, where have uh, you encountered sorting uh, just in every day using a computer? What are some examples? Cole? We might have software like a spreadsheet like Microsoft Excel that has some built-in capability to sort. Um, and an important note is this might be This might be sorting in alphabetical order or numerical or, or perhaps uh, something else. Uh, other examples where you've seen sorting. Yeah, the files on our computer are can be sorted by all sorts of things, like the date they were created or their name. It would be a real pain if they weren't sorted and you just got them in a different they you just had them in a different random order every time you looked at the files on your computer. That would not be very helpful. Um, so yeah, we've seen sorting the files. Other examples, Sam. Another one that a person that I use is uh, sorting in music. For example, sorting, sorting by artist name or by date downloaded. <laughs> yeah, we might sort music either in an app or if we have files that are our music files, sorting those. Gary? Uh, 
some like online shopping like sort um like all of the results based on the price or based on relevant software. Yeah, many places we go online will give us the ability to sort the things that we're seeing um, uh, by price, by customer review, by how close they are to us, things like that. Max? If you search something on Google, um, the search results would be sorted based on whatever insane algorithm they have. Yes, many times online, things are sorted even when you didn't ask for them to be sorted. So Google sorts some results. Maybe that's a sponsored thing appears at the top because someone has paid Google. Others might be sorted by how likely they think that matches what you're searching for. Uh, if you go on to uh, Netflix or uh, Facebook, both of these places are presenting uh, a feed or a series of choices in a particular order because that company wants you to spend more time on that on that site. So Netflix is saying, well, I think these are the five movies or shows that you are most likely to click on, so we're going to put them at the top. Or Facebook's algorithm will uh, more likely to show you posts that they predict you will comment on or, or click on to keep you on the site. So this is all just to say that putting things in some order is everywhere when we're using computers. And so this operation of sorting is a pretty, pretty fundamental one. This brings me to uh, another question, which is, Let's say we have a list L and an element list square brackets I, so an element at, at index I. I would like you to uh, brainstorm with your neighbors for a minute how we might express what it means for the list L to be sorted in terms of an element i and maybe the other elements in the list. So we're looking for a a formal definition of, of sorted. Like what has to be true about list element i for any value of i that would make the list sorted. So see, brainstorm for a couple minutes with, with your neighbors how you might write that down. <coughs> All right, what, anyone have a uh, uh, thought or, or suggestion for what it would mean for our list to be, to be sorted? Nice can we uh, sort through things like index? Sorry, can you say that again? Can we sort through like, things like index, like where it holds and the like, position of where it is on the list? Uh, yeah, so, so if we have an element at, at index i, how would we know whether the list is sorted? Oh. Like, is there some way we could check whether that list was sorted? Sammy? Uh, you can check to see if the list is in an increasing or decreasing format according to a certain uh, parameter. <laughs> yeah, we... It would matter whether we were sorting it from smallest to largest, like uh, which is called ascending, or from largest to smallest, called descending. Uh, so for either of these, suggestion for how we could uh, 
write down some, some properties, some relationship between elements in the list that would mean it was sorted. What? Right. And we could do like an I minus one and then the same before the I number equals one. That the element at I has to be less than I plus one. Is that what you were gonna say, Cole? Yeah, that and the thing before it, it should be when I minus one should be less than I. Yeah. I guess you don't need to keep that in. Yeah, that's that's right. That if if I is um, if we're saying I could be any of the elements for every one of them, this needs to be this needs to be true. What if we had the list three three three? Is this list sorted? Equally no? less than instead of just less than. Yeah, I, we, we might amend this to, it has to be less than or equal to the thing after it. So uh, we can kind of write down, um, a property that applies to every element of our list, uh, where if it's true for every index i, then the list will be sorted. And this is assuming that, that if there is no index i plus 1, then it, it doesn't, there's nothing to check. Something at the end of the list, we've already checked that the thing before it is, is less than or equal to it. Questions on this? Maybe. I have a question. So is the problem that we assuming that using numbers, is there one that's like independent of some kind of thing? In the list, you can sort it. Is there a way to find it that way? That's a great question. Um, does this only work if our list is numbers, or does it work with other things? The answer is it works with anything where we can say that one of those things is less than another. And the kind of term for that is. that the elements must be comparable. That if we have no way to say whether one of them is less than another, <coughs> then that's not a thing that we can sort. Because there is no way, like we don't have any way to, until we define what it means for one to be less than another, then we can't, um, uh, uh, then we can't uh, sort them. So that means we have some things that can be sorted, numbers. Um, on our brainstorming here, we also saw that you might put things in alphabetical orders, uh, alphabetical order, strings in Python. You can say one string less than another, and that checks alphabetical order. Um, if we had a list of lists or a, uh, a list of Enigma key objects, those, like, we don't have any way to say one list is less than another, or one ending McKee object is less than another. Those are not things that are comparable, not things that, that we could sort. Other questions? So always important to ask why we are uh, uh, learning any, any particular things. So, Why would we study sorting? Uh, I'll first tell you it's not because I expect you to, you to need to implement your own sorting algorithm. Uh, that's almost always a built-in function of whatever uh, 
computational thing we're doing. So in, in Python, we can say my list dot sort, for example, and that will sort the list uh, in Excel or uh, uh, music app or Google results. These are all things where the sorting is 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 already implemented. So we're not we're not learning this because uh, you're going to uh, your next Python program. You're going to need to sort and you're going to need to to do it from scratch. So there are a couple good reasons why. The main one is that there are many different sorting algorithms, they have different properties, and an important part of computer science is given some algorithm, some procedure for sorting or for uh, searching or for whatever it is, that we be able to analyze how efficient it is, what kinds of properties does it have or, or not have, and sorting just provides us a lot of uh, uh, kind of useful things for for uh, uh, practicing this kind of analysis that we can then apply to other kinds of code. Um, and there's a very practical reason, which is having taken an intro to computer science course, people will expect you to know about sorting, to have heard of different kinds of sorting algorithms, to know which ones are the more efficient ones. And so good for kind of the big ideas that we're going to get into, and also it's something that, that you'll be expected to know, and I don't want to, to, to uh, do the, the disservice of, of leaving you leaving you without it. All right. Let's talk about how we would actually sort a list. Uh, so something that, that uh, I do before class each time is I take the stack of 36 clicker cards, and I put them into uh, uh, order so that they can, so that, that it's easy to find uh, the number you're looking for. So uh, again, I'd like you to brainstorm with your neighbors for a couple minutes, just in English, how you would describe a way to take this mixed up stack of 36 cards and put them in order from 1 to 36. all right someone uh, share a uh, a strategy or approach that uh, came up in your discussion? Emma? You can always like 
go through the list and find the smallest one and then find the next smallest one. Or like take that one out and then find the next smallest one. Indeed, this has a name. Selection sort. We each time we're going to go and select the next smallest, the, the next one that should appear in order. So we um, <coughs> or if we were sorting things in descending order, the next largest. Uh, but we. We go through, we, we search through all the cards, we find one, put that in, put that aside. Go through all the cards, find two, put that with the one and kind of keep finding the next smallest. Uh, that would be, that would be one strategy. Anyone, anyone talk about a, a different approach? Ava? We've just decided that it might be better to uh, just go through one by one and if it's slower or smaller, then sort them that way. So you kind of have a sort of pound going as you go through them. So uh, say the, the top three are like 7, 2, and 15. So I would take 7. And what would I do with it? Uh, you take 2 and put it in the front, and then 7, and then 15, and then just keep going through like that. This also has a name, it's called insertion sort, which means we take whichever one is on top and we insert it into the correct place in the ones that we've sorted so far. And this is literally what I do with the cards. I have keep them in one hand and keep sort of slotting them into the place in the larger and larger kind of sorted pile. So, Kind of each time inserting the next one into into the the sorted uh, kind of ones we've sorted so far. Any other uh, approaches come to mind as you were discussing? So no one has suggested my favorite kind of sorting called Bogo sort. <laughs> We're just going to shuffle the cards. Are they sorted? Nope. Shuffle them again. Are they sorted? Nope. Shuffle again. I mean, it may take from now until eternity, um, but, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a thing you could do. Um, there's another kind of sort which uh, um, we want to talk about in, in detail uh, <clears throat> called bubble sort, where uh, each card you would kind of move it behind one that it's bigger than until you found one that is bigger than it, and you kind of keep sort of bubbling up each card as you go through, um, and kind of eventually this ends up with uh, the list being sorted, but we're going to focus on this selection sort and insertion sort today. So let's actually uh, put in some pseudocode for our insertion sort, and they've hidden my erasers. Ta da! All right, so. For insertion sort, uh, for i from 1 to n minus 1. So notice this is not Python, this is pseudocode. So it's sort of a mix between English and code. So for i, which is going to be an, uh, an index like in our uh, formal definition, we were thinking in terms of an element at index i. Uh, so I'll use the same kind of idea 
in the pseudocode. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to find where to insert element i. into the sorted portion of the list. So part of our list will be sorted, part of it will not. And for each i, for each spot in our list, starting at, uh, at uh, uh, 1, so these lists are got where the indexes started at 0. So we're starting with the, the second element. We're going to find the spot to insert it uh, in the sorted portion. And the second step will be to insert our element i at, uh, at that spot that we found and shift everything else over to make room for it at that spot. So we can take a look at what this looks like in an example. So let's say we have a list here of 42, 1, 43, 3, and, and so on. And so our insertion sort starts with uh, the blue is the sorted portion and the red is the unsorted portion. So we're just going to say whatever the first element is, that's going to be our sorted portion to start. So it starts as something. Um, and then we start by considering the element at index 1. And we find where should that go in this blue sorted portion? Well, it should go before 40. So we're going to shift 40 over 1 to make room and then stick 2 into that spot. So now our short sorted portion shows up as 2 and then 40. And that's kind of one time through this loop. I is now 2. We're going to find... Uh, where the element at index 2 goes in our sorted portion again at the beginning. So we shift 2 and 40 over uh, and insert 1 uh, at the start. Then we consider 43. Where should it go in our sorted portion? Well, it belongs at the end, and so we don't have to move anything over to make room for it. Uh, we just insert it in the sorted portion by leaving it where it is. And we just then consider the first four elements now are the sorted portion. Keep moving through. We consider uh, the element at index 4. We search through our sorted portion uh, and discover that it should go uh, between 2 and 40. So that means 40 and 43 would each need to move over one spot to make room for 3 to give us uh, these five numbers in, in sorted order. 65 is a, another one where it's already in the right position for the sorted order, so we can leave it there. Zero, we have to, it's very quick to find where it goes. It's less than the first thing in our sorted portion, but then we have to shift everything over one uh, in order to make room. And our last 58, we shift 65 over and put 58 uh, into there. And now we have considered the last index in our list of n uh, numbers. And now the entire list is part of the sorted portion, and we have finished uh, sorting the list. Any questions on, on that? Any part of this uh, that's not clear? All right, so a couple, uh, a couple observations uh, from this is uh, different steps in this involved a different number of shifts, like how many things we had to, to shift over one space to make room. Uh, so now it's uh, your turn to run through this insertion sort algorithm. 
So this is, let's say we have uh, a list A. It has five numbers in it, 18, 14, 70, 17, and 53. And uh, after I equals 1, so the first time through this loop, we considered the element at index 1. It was less than the first thing in our sorted list, so we had to shift 18 over and put 14 at the beginning. So that was one shift, and 14 and 18 are now the sorted portion. So uh, go ahead and work with your neighbors to kind of fill out the remaining three rows of this table. Uh, what, if anything, will move, and how many shifts uh, uh, will it take? Oh, I see. All right, let's fill in this, this table. So after i equals 2, what will our uh, list of five numbers be? Gabby? So it will take one, it'll be 14, 18, 17, 17. And stayed the same. The 70 was already in the right in the right spot. And when it stays the same, we got zero shifts. Uh, someone help me out with uh, the next the next step. Cool. Uh, 14, 17, 18, 70. How many shifts did that did that take? Two. Yeah, because we had to move 18 and 70 each over to make room for <coughs> 17. All right. How about our last our last step? What happens there? Anyway. The only thing that switches is going to be 70 at 53. So I put 14, 17, 18, 53, 70 with a shift of 1. Exactly. That we shifted 53 over 1 to put it in the in the right place in our in our sorted portion. Uh, any questions on that? Do, do those steps make sense and, and how we're counting the shifts? All right. So... I told you that one of the reasons we're looking, or that the main reason even we're talking about sorting, is so that we can analyze these algorithms. So we've stepped through some examples, uh, but now we want to uh, kind of express more formal, formally, formally um, how efficient this uh, uh, this algorithm is. So uh, there are two parts to this. Uh, the first is we're going to be very pessimistic about this algorithm. We want to we want to perform worst case analysis. We want to consider uh, how much work is involved in doing insertion sort in the case where it does the most possible work, in, in the worst case. And uh, the unit we're going to use is we're going to carefully count up the number of steps, kind of the number of things that this algorithm has to do. Uh, and there are two kinds of steps we're going to be uh, considering. Uh, a comparison, so anytime we have to compare two numbers to check uh, which one is, is smaller, that's going to count as a step. And every time we have to shift a number over inside our list, that's going to count as a step. So if we consider an insertion sort, we're going to start from i equals 1, i equals 2, i equals 3, uh, up to our last time around this loop. So when we're counting the steps, we're counting for every time, kind of through whatever loops we're doing, how many steps do each of those involve, all the way up to i equals n minus 1. So 
when i equals one so i'll put this this picture back up here So when i equals 1, in the worst case, when we're trying to find where our next element should go in the sorted portion, how many things do we have to compare it to? John? The length of the list. I think in this case it's not quite that bad, because we want to find where it goes in the sorted portion. Oh, so, so like in this case. Um, yeah, so, so when i equals 1, which means we're considering the second element of the list, how big is our, our sorted portion going to be? Yeah, it's just one thing in it, which means that we're going to have at most one comparison. We're going to have to compare it to the one thing in our sorted portion. Um, and similarly, what is the most number of shifts that we might have to do uh, as part of this second step of making room? Yeah, also one shift. Now let's consider i equals 2. Again, thinking in the worst case, how many comparisons would we need to do to find where it goes in the sorted portion? Maybe two, right? Yeah, we might, have, uh, we might have to do two comparisons. And what in the worst case is the number of shifts that we might have to do? Also, also two. <laughs> if we consider i equals three, I think this pattern will repeat itself. We might have to check all three things in our sort of portion so far. We might have to shift them all, all over. And we continue this down to we're on the very last element of our list. How many things, if our list has n things in it, how many uh, might we need to compare to to find where our last <laughs> element goes? N minus one. Yeah, we'd have to do n minus one comparison. Since we have one element that's not sorted, we might have to compare it to all n minus one of the elements that we've already sorted. And similarly, we might have to shift them all over. So now we've sort of written down all the steps involved for a list of any size, because we left the size of the list as a variable n. So for any value of n, this kind of lays out how many steps that's going to take. So now we just need to add them all up. So we're adding the numbers 1 through n minus 1. And uh, there's a nice trick for this, uh, that uh, when we add the numbers of 1 through some number, uh, we get, uh, in this case, 1 through n minus 1, we would get n times n minus 1 divided by 2 total. Comparisons. And similarly, n times n minus 1 over 2 total shifts. So if we add these together, multiply them out, this gives us n squared minus n steps. So in some sense, we have kind of quantified how much work it takes to do insertion sort uh, when our list has has n things in the worst case. Like it could be much better than this, but we know it can't be worse. So if we're worried about writing a computer program and we don't, it's fine if it goes very fast. We just want to make sure that it doesn't go so slow that it takes I don't know, hours to or, or days or weeks to finish. So 
Worst case, it's going to, to help us understand that. And we're also really only concerned uh, when n is really large. Because if we're sorting a list of, like I have on the screen, eight things, even BOGO sort is probably going to be fine for just sorting only eight things. Because there just aren't that many ways of rearranging eight things, and the computer can try these different, uh, can generate random uh, arrangements pretty quickly. Um, but certainly, insertion sort, much better than BOGO sort. And it's going to be fine. Um, even something that does a lot more work than insertion sort, we're not going to notice how long that takes to sort eight things. But if it's eight billion things, that's another matter. So we're concerned both about the worst case n when n is big, because that's when uh, this, this sort of measurement might really matter. And uh, if we think about, uh, let's say, a graph where uh, we have n um, like this is increasing n, and this is the line for n, and n squared, something like this. n squared is going to get bigger much, much faster than n will. My example of when n is 8 billion. This n is 8 billion, but 8 billion squared, 64 billion billion. Much, much bigger. 64 billion billion will not even notice 8 billion less. That's like one eighth of one billionth of the n squared total. And so when computer scientists think about how do we formally express the efficiency of an algorithm, they use what's called big O notation. And kind of the, the intuitive way to understand this is we're only going to care about the biggest factor, which means that if we have n and n squared, we only care about the n squared, because when n gets large, n squared is going to make the n totally unnoticeable. And so we would say that insertion sort is big O of n squared in its efficiency. And this is the kind of formal way of saying that if we have a list of size n, the amount of work that insertion, insertion sort has to do is proportional to n squared in the worst case. That we could expect if we double the size of our list, that our algorithm will take about four times as long. All right, what are your, what are your questions on this sort of analysis of insertion sort? Okay. So it would be proportional to n squared. Would it just? Why would it just be n squared? Uh, because in reality we have this minus n here, so it's not precisely n squared. Um, and maybe there's some other, like, what if our algorithm uh, checks if the list is empty um, before it goes to sort it, uh, or what if it prints it out afterward? Uh, this sort of that check beforehand and that printout afterward, those don't depend on the length of the list necessarily. Um, and so we might actually have n squared minus n plus 5 or something. So but we're, we care just about n squared. So it's kind of as n grows bigger, it's kind of proportional to n squared in terms of how, how, many, how much more work it takes to, to sort it using insertion sort. What other questions do you have?
All right, let's run through our second algorithm, uh, which will be uh, selection sort. If we were to write pseudocode for a selection sort, uh, we would do for i from 0 to n minus 2. Uh, so starting with the first all the way up to, but not including the very last. We're going to find our uh, index of the smallest element in the range of indexes uh, from i to n minus 1. So whatever spot we're, tr basically i is the spot we're trying to fill, the next spot in, in our list. And we want to find which element is the next smallest, which element should go at, into index i. So we're going to search through kind of the rest of the list from there. Um, and I'm going to call this index of the smallest element j. And then my second step I will swap the elements at i and j, just switch their positions. So in an example, I have my same list from before. I have my same list from before. And my first step is to search through the whole list to find the smallest thing uh, in the range of 0 uh, uh, up to n minus 1. So I search all those those indexes for the smallest one and then swap it with the thing at index 0. So I 0 is the smallest one I can find. I swap it with 40. And so now I have a sorted portion, which is the smallest one I found. And 40 is just kind of wherever I put it, uh, where I found 0. That's one time through this loop. So now i is 1. Now I'm trying to find what goes at index 1. And again, I search through from index 1 all the way to the end to get the smallest element I can find. That's 1. And I swap it into place. That puts 2 here, which is convenient. I, find, I search from index 2 to the end, find that 2 is the smallest, swap it with itself so it doesn't move, and proceed to find the next smallest, swap it into position, which moves 43 up 1, Find the next smallest, that would be 40, swap it into the next spot I want to fill, uh, uh, and continue finding the smallest one, which in this case is 43, swapping it into position. And once I have swapped something into the second to last position, I know that the largest thing in the list is the only thing that I haven't swapped into place yet, which means it's at the end, which is where I want it to be. So different set of steps to kind of figure out uh, to uh, rearrange the list into sorted order, but it still, it still got the job done. Questions on, on this example? Cool. To find the next smallest element, um, do you have to go all the way back through the unsorted list again to compare it against everything else? Yes, so each time we look for the smallest element, we have to check everything in the unsorted, in the red portion of the list. Because for all we know, the smallest thing might be at the very end of it. And it's not sorted, so we just we have to do a linear search through it. Other questions? All right, 
So we can uh, again do our, our worst case uh, analysis of how much, how many steps our selection sort is going to do. So uh, when i equals 1, how many, or i equals <coughs> 0, when i equals 0, how many comparisons would we need to do to find the smallest element in the unsorted portion? Okay. Yeah, and like the whole list. It would be, uh, we, n yeah, n minus 1. Because we have one element and we need to compare it to every other element in the list. So we do n minus 1 comparisons. Uh, and then I'll add another type of operation that we're counting. The swap. How many swaps would we need to do? Yeah, just, just one swap. We find the smallest and swap it with whatever is in that first index. Uh, how about our, our when i equals 1, how many comparisons is it going to take to find the, the smallest thing? Marcus? N minus 2. Yeah, we have one thing that we've sorted, but we still have to check everything else uh, to, find, to find our smallest. And we're still going to have one swap. And this pattern is going to continue. <coughs> N minus 3 comparisons, one swap uh, for i equals 2. And in our very last step here, uh, how many uh, how many comparisons uh, when we have uh, just two elements that aren't sorted yet? How many comparisons would we need to do? Four. Yeah, we would need to compare it to the other element that isn't sorted to figure out which is which is smaller. So that's one comparison. I give it. The word is comparison. I'm sure you know that. Um, so now we've charted out how many, uh, uh, how much work we're doing each time around our loop. And again, we're going to to add it all up. We again, have our uh, n minus one uh, sum of of one through n minus one. So that's again going to be n times n minus 1 over 2, we add up all the swaps, which uh, 0 through n minus 2, that'll be um, uh, a total of n minus 1 swaps. Uh, add this all up. And for our selection sort, we have uh, n squared divided by 2 uh, uh, minus n divided by 2 uh, plus n minus 1. So simplify this plus n divided by 2 minus 1. And just like before, we're going to consider uh, only the biggest factor, which means <clears throat> we're going to ignore all constants, meaning all parts of this expression that don't depend on n, because they're not going to change as n gets bigger, and we're interested in describing how does this algorithm perform as n gets bigger. So we're going to ignore the divided by 2s, we're going to ignore the n and the minus 1, and again focus just on the n squared, and so selection sort is also big O of n squared. That we expect that as n gets bigger, the amount of work involved is proportional to n squared. Questions on that? Cool. Um, so 
A swap is different than a big shift. A swap is like something that most programming languages can just do without shifting everything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is a useful observation that this kind of uh, algorithmic analysis, this big O of n squared, it is deliberately obscuring some of the, the details of what the algorithm is doing. Like, is it doing a shift or a swap? Um, we have decided just to count all of these things as one unit of work, and then to count up how many units of work it takes, and then simplify that to just the biggest factor. And this allows us to say that uh, kind of from a, a 50,000 foot view, selection sort and insertion sort one is not more efficient than the other. Okay. So just to clarify, like selection sort would be faster, but only at uh, list sizes where it doesn't matter because they're both so fast. So selection sort, um, yes. So so you could have an implementation of selection sort and an implementation of insertion sort, and which one is factor and is faster in practice might depend on. Uh, the details of how the programming language is performing shifts versus swaps, or um, uh, kind of which particular inputs you tested it on. Um, and what our analysis is saying is that in terms of how the amount of time the algorithm will take changes as the size of the list changes, as n gets bigger, <clears throat> or we would expect those to be uh, similar that they would both be quadratic, that they would get four times faster or four times slower for a list that's twice as large. Other questions? All right, so a bit of a, a teaser for Friday. Uh, Big O of n squared is not the best we can do when it comes to sorting. There are uh, faster algorithms, and we'll uh, look at one of them in, in detail on Friday called merge sort. And uh, what I would like to do now is a bit of analysis practice. So I have here a, a contains function. Hopefully it looks familiar. We wrote one of these uh, uh, last time. And now uh, I would like you to analyze how much work uh, is contains going to have to do in the worst case uh, in terms of the length of nums, which I'll call n. So if nums is a list with n things in it, and of which of these uh, uh, big O expressions kind of uh, appropriately characterizes or describes how much work uh, this will take. All right, please discuss with your neighbor how you thought about uh, uh, counting up how much work this, this function would do. Right, this will indeed be big O of n in the worst case. Uh, can anyone think of what what is that worst case? Like what uh, like what is the scenario where we have to to do big O of n max? Yeah. Um, the x the num the last letter in or the last number in num equals x. Or it's the last one. <laughs> it was the last one. Uh, then we'd have to, to go through and, and check everything in the list. Uh, is there another possibility? Marcus? Um, if x is not in the list. If x is not in the list, we also have to check everything in the list to actually verify that it's not in the list. And for each time through this loop, we're doing kind of one step, one comparison. So we're doing something once for each element, 
and that something involves just one step. So that's why we have um, uh, big O of n compared to our sorting, which for each spot in the list, we're doing some sort of searching through a bunch of things in the list or shifting over a bunch of things in the list. Uh, so in this, actually, even though there are four doesn't show up two times, there are actually two loops going on here. One to go through all the spots that we want to select something for, and another loop which is finding the smallest element. That's also kind of looping through some portion of the list. So I uh, sort of, it doesn't always work out this way, but kind of for each, uh, if we have multiple loops, we kind of expect a factor of n for kind of each nested loop we had. Um, in that if for each element of our list, we do some amount of work that involves each element of the list, that's where our, our n squared comes from. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I have office hours starting in 10 minutes, and I will see you Friday.